story. And uh, as you told in the beginning, this Sunday is about God's generosity. But first of all, I want um, to give the band applause. Hey, they, they rocked the second time today here at the, the, the stage, and they did very well, and it's very warm, and uh, they're doing their best. A few months ago, uh, Dan and Karin, Dan is uh, yes, at the moment not here, but maybe come later, he phoned me and said, uh, maybe, Ralph, if you are, um, is it possible for you that you come to ICF Stuttgart? And I said, okay, ICF Stuttgart, I want to see ICF Stuttgart. It's a very beautiful city, and Dan and Pastor Kari are wonderful people. And say, oh, I, I come, I come. And later on, he told me um, um, the topic of this Sunday, Ralph, that is generosity. And first of all, I thought, okay, that's really a challenge for me. It's a beautiful challenge, but, uh, you know, I'm coming from a family, and I will tell you later a little bit more about that. I'm coming from a family where generosity is not a big theme. It's not a big topic. I've never learned it in my home. My parents and my mother and my grandparents, they are not about generosity in their lifestyle. So I thought, hey, really, that's a really good topic, but also it's a really challenge for me. God's generosity, hey, we are talking about the center the center of God's nature, the center of God's love, for, of, of his character. And um, oh, something else. And Dan told me a few days ago, I have to speak in English. A few days ago, he told me, hey, yeah, in the afternoon, uh, four o'clock, that's in English. And I said, what? So uh, my beautiful wife, she's with me here, Irene, and she translated everything for me. Give her an applause, yeah. And she did it very, very well. And if the grammar is wrong, she translated it. So, okay, be, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. So, look, we are, we are, looking, for a, we are looking for a secret in God's character. And say, let's, the secret is God is generous, his love is generous, and he shows us in his life of Jesus Christ that he's this abundant love for us. And his love is so... Great, so amazing, and his character is such a generous character. And um, in the New Testament, you see different reports, different reports witness God's joy over abundance. Remember, there's a scene um, that this is the first, the first public miracle what Jesus did. He went to a wedding, and uh, during the wedding. So some people come to, to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, there's no more wine to drink here. You have ever been at the wedding where there's no wine? Oh, that's awful. That's awful. There's nothing to drink and so it's boring. So and so later on uh, you're drinking water. And the people say, oh, Jesus, that's a problem. And later, later on Jesus made this first public miracle and he turned water into wine. And I figured out it's about 900 bottles of wine. 900 bottles of wine from Chateau Neuf du Pape. That's a really good wine. 900 bottles. That's more than enough for the, for the whole wedding. Through the whole night they can drink and drink and drink and drink. And, and, and Jesus, he, he, yeah, he has joy about that. He says, why? Well, enough for everybody. Or the other, on the feast, about 5,000 people at the end of all. There was still a lot of leftovers. The overflowing generosity of God blasts the horizon of the very first church. And it doesn't want to stop at my door or your doors. And that's the fascinating thing about God's generosity. Yeah, it, it, corrects, it corrects our little egomanical heart open. For sure mine. And maybe yours, I don't know. It cracks it open and makes space for other people around you. Maybe if you read it recently, the Forbes magazine uh, published um, the new list, the new list of the famous and the richest, newest, richest people in the US. That's nothing new. The last 22 years, Mr. Bill Gates. He's at the top. And the second one is Warren Buffett. Uh, Bill in the pool position. 
and Warrens behind him. Uh, 22 years now. But in the magazine, there was also an article with the title, Sharing Makes Rich. And I thought, hey, that's interesting, I want to read that. Sharing makes, makes rich. And under this, in this article, it was explained that now the three, the first three billionaires of the so-called sharing economy are now on the list. Is uh, has anybody uh, going with Airbnb on holiday or... Stay over in the night, yeah? one, okay, two, oh, you, you can, yeah, a few people. And Uber taxi, something you used, Uber taxi, you're the same man. <laughs> I hear it. You two people, you a few people, you make the first billionaires possible. Because the investors of the Airbnb and Uber taxi made it into the Forbes list. It's the first time sharing economy. And if you take a closer look um, uh, to the, those reports on the list, then you will find they are always about the same stuff. Who got a little bit more, and the other people who lost some money, and why. So basically, the whole list is about mathematics, nothing else. Numbers, numbers, and mathematics. Some more, some lost. The more you have, the richer can you, 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 you can get. And well, at least if you are not totally messing up the whole thing. It's pretty simple to illustrate that. You can see, I have here 10 euro. It's not much, much. For, for few people maybe, oh, it's 10 euros. It's quite a lot. If I give this money today away, then I have less than 10 euro. The simpler. You follow me? You follow me? Oh, okay, okay. It's warm, I know, I know. That's very simple. Otherwise, say you're 10 euro. On the other hand, I have here around 150 Swiss francs, 100 euro, something a little bit more. And if I decide today I give 50 Swiss francs away or 10 euro away, so then I have less in my pocket. So the common wisdom will tell us, keep it here. Keep it here and don't give it away. But when, if you give it away, then you have less in your pocket. You're less, the less you give, the more you have for your own. That's your really easy common sense wisdom. Make the best of it. Make as much out of it as you possibly can and try to keep your money all together. But generosity, especially God's generosity, works a different way. Really a different way. And we will call it so uncommon wisdom. An uncommon sense. It's the kind of wisdom that does not just pop into your head automatically. But through all the centuries, you can read about the, the God's wisdom. The uncommon wisdom about generosity. We want to read in, chapter, in Luke, in chapter 6. Jesus quoted there, Give, and I will be given to you. A good measure, pressured down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For which the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Read it. Have a closer look to this verse. And then you recognize that it's not an order that Jesus is giving here. You have to give or you should give. No. It's not an order. You have to do it. It's a simply observation of life, how it functions. It's a claim that the common sense about money and possession, that if you give something away, you have less, that that is wrong. In other words, if you start looking for this God's wisdom, this uncommon sense, you find different, different verses in the Bible. In Proverbs chapter 11, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Hey, here again, it's, it's a claim. It's a thesis. It's an observation of life. When it comes to uh, finances, your property, or your own generosity, common sense, hey, common sense is wrong. If you give less, you have more. That's a common sense. And the Bible says, no. If you give away, you, you will be given. 
and we receive more. Another, another verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We stop here. Again, it's a thesis, it's an observation of life. You give and you will receive. There's something really new. And the Bible challenged us to say, hey, give freely and you will receive. When it comes to our resources, God bless. When it comes to our resources, our finances, uh, regarding to Paul, that's not about losing or winning or having more or less. It's about soaring and reaping, harvesting. Before you can harvest something, you have to give something away. And then it can grow up. It's a long time ago. It's a long, long, long time. It's before the internet. There was a time before the internet. It's really, yeah. The old people remember that here. And uh, it's long before the Industrial Revolution. Somebody makes a brilliant idea. Instead of persisting life as hunters and gatherers, Instead of immediately consuming everything, what I have, I'm going to saw it and put it in the earth. I, and I see, maybe it pops up. Somebody had an idea. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like a voice from the heaven says, grow, grow, come up, come on. He saw the first growing. But he decided, oh, I don't consume everything for me, for myself. A little bit I put it by, by sight and put it to the ground. And I will see maybe it grows up. And this is how it works. This is how God's generosity works. And also how it works with our finances and also with our resources. You have to saw something. Money in our possession rules the same way. Take something, give it away, and it will start to grow and bloom. And to all of you, I'll make a pause, to all of you who believe in the prosperity gospel, I tell you, no way. That is not an easy way to get rich. No way. It's nothing to do with that. It's only about you take something from your resources and give it away, and you see, God use that for the best for the other people. For God's kingdom. And now you're sitting here and say, okay, uh, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe a good, good idea. But we have to test it if it really works. And for sure, some people tested it. They tested it. And um, among others, Christian Smith, he's a professor of psychology in the Notre Dame University of Indiana. For a year, for years, he with several others investigated the topic generosity on an academic, scientific level. He said, okay, I want to prove, I want to see what make, if there makes it a sense for somebody who is generous, who gives something away, what is the impact of the life of this person? And what is the impact of the life of, in, in the life of a person who say, I don't want to give anything away. I want to okay, all for me, for myself. I'm looking for me. I, I want to live in a selfish life. I, everything for me and nothing for others. Is there a difference in their lifestyle? Is there a difference of their quality of life? At the end of the day, he published a book, very worth to read, I tell you. It's The Paradox of Generosity. You can buy it and read it. It's really, really um, worthy to read. And I want to give you a little summary. A little summary. You, you know, you have to read by your own. 
but a little summary I give you, maybe you, you will buy it. Generosity is paradoxical. Those who give receive back in turn. By spending ourselves for others' well-being, we enhance our own standing. In letting go of some what we own, we better secure our own lives. By giving ourselves away, we ourselves move toward flourishing. This is not a philosophical or, a re or a religious teaching. It is a sociological fact. The man is not a Christian. Huh? We can describe the paradox also in the negative way. Those who try keeping everything to themselves for their own suffer the loss of quality of life in long term. Even worse, it actually costs them more. It's crazy, eh? We are, we are not talking about a religious thing, about some verses in the Bible only. We are talking also over a study over years with hundreds and thousands of interviews made in the U.S. Completely independent of what the Bible means. Hey, to see how um, selfishness influences one's life, um, I want to have a look with you in the Bible. Those, to, to a man... I would quote, uh, he's the most selfish person in the whole Bible. You know which person I mean? The whole, the selfish person I ever met. We'll read about that. It's in the Old Testament. And the guy, Pharaoh. In Exodus, you can read how it works in his life. Exodus chapter 1. They're standing, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. And we stop here. And this is of importance. Said, then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. It has been Joseph and the people of Israel who made Egypt great and rich in the old days. He was a guy who made Egypt rich, who made the power even rich. It was Joseph and the people of Israel. But um, to whom Joseph meant nothing. Nobody knows him now, today. Goes on, look, he said to the people, the Israelis have, come, have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal readily with them or they will become even more numerous and, if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So, they put slave masters over them to oppress them with the forced labor and they built Pitom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Christian Smith, writer of the book, um, writes in his book some of the consequences of not being generous in life. And the first consequence is of not living generosity. People tend to think and live obsessive, a selfish lifestyle. People tend and to live a selfish lifestyle. And the Pharaoh, he's the model for such a lifestyle. The only thing he can think about is, um, I want more. More bricks, more slaves, more storehouses. More. I, don't, I only want more. At that time, Pharaoh, he was the, the richest man in the known world. The richest man. But he wants more. And by the way, he was, this, he, he was a most unsecure man at that time. Oh, I'm losing something. I'm afraid about that. So I want more. I want more and more. What a miserable idea of life when you're kept by fear of all you might possibly lose. 
And then the situation goes on. Moses later on was sent to Pharaoh. Chapter 5, we read Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And what is the answer of Pharaoh? How did he respond? Yeah. But he could say something different. He, had say, he could say, oh, how long will you go? And why is it so important for you? And at which time will you will come back? And uh, how uh, are your people doing? And uh, he could ask all these kind of questions, but he didn't. It. In his brains, there were only bricks. More bricks. That's the goal for him and for his empire. And so the story goes on in chapter 6. The same day Pharaoh gave his order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to, supp to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But we require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. And then he says something else, words, which are often said by people who have much more than others. Sometimes called to people who, are, who have heart's fear in Germany. They say, and Pharaoh says, lazy, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice for the Lord. Now go to work. You are lazy, lazy. Smith describes a further consequence of a result of a selfish lifestyle. He said the second thing, people tend to develop a deformed, dis, uh, dis, disordered um, view of people. They tend to a deformed view of people, which ultimately leads to a loneliness in their life. Look, at the moment, in Germany and even in, in Switzerland, uh, we are all experiencing a, a huge, a huge um, a stream of refugees searching for a new life, um, a way to survive in our West, Western Europe countries. It's remarkable how people at the, moment, at the moment respond to this. Economic refugees, war refugees, poor people, people laying at the railway station in Basel, you can see it at the corners, you see it in different under, under, uh, other uh, German cities. And the political debates flourish in all kinds of directions. And I don't want to make a political statement at the moment here. But personally, how do you and I, how do we respond personally? When you see people laying down there, when you see a family under the bridge, at the moment, every, every day, 50, 60 people coming to our church and we have a German course, People coming from, uh, from Africa, from Syria, from all over the world. They're coming with, with family, with, with, with kids, with babies. And they're sitting there and um, we give them some clothes and food and so on. How do we resp respond personally if you see such people coming your way? Your way to work or at the railway station. What do we do? Susan Fiske a psychologist as well, did researches on the behavior of people concerning their reaction toward strangers, the way we evaluate the encounter with, strange, uh, with strangers. Not only refugees, also strange, uh, strange people, uh, strangers, <laughs> not strange people. You see somebody, I've never seen you, this man or this woman here, it's the first time I see you, how we respond to another. And she says, look, the most people have two reactions or two questions when you see an, a stranger. So, the first question is, does my counterpart intend good 
Oder bad towards me. Is that a good guy? Or I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. you're not sure? He's a good guy, yeah? He looks good over here, for sure. That's the first question. You are not sure, is that a person? I, oh, I, I love her. I love him. He's a good guy. He's a good girl. Hey, wonderful to see you and you feel uh, empathy for the people. That's the first question. And the second question is, is my counterpart, counterpart capable to achieve their own plans? Has he a comp is he competent to do something to, um, for his work or in the church or something else? Is he a person who can really achieve something in life, in his personal life? The first question is about the climate. It's about the climate between people. And therefore, here we have this wonderful flip chart. And my wife made this wonderful drawing. Yes, yes, guy. Oh, I thought nobody would clap. Yes, it's wonderful. Yes, yeah, look good. The first question is about the climate between us people. And that's the question about warmth. I love this man, I love this woman. He's a really good guy. And maybe it's very high. We think, we think, okay, that's very good, good, good person. And the other question is about the competence. We think about the people who are, hmm, maybe he's competent, maybe he, he can achieve something. Let's see. And now, through this window, we, uh, we evaluate all the people which we met in our daily business. Toward those who feel very, we have very warm, and we, we think they are very high competence, we admire them. We admire them. You're looking at soccer, maybe uh, some soccer fans here. I won't explain to you. I, uh, uh, from my point of view, the FC Basel, that's the home, uh, in our hometown, this football club, the soccer club, best. We won the championship in Switzerland. That is a, that is a club, oh, I feel, have a lot of feelings about this club. And if, uh, I think this club is very competent. He's the best in Switzerland. In Germany, I would say that is um, Borussia Dortmund. You know Borussia Dortmund? The internationals knows. You don't know Borussia Dortmund? Oh, that is. I can't believe that. Is that a church here? Oh, no. I can. Also, that says in Germany, Borussia, I believe in Borussia Dortmund. It's a very, very good club. And I, feel, I have a lot of feelings about this club. Now, now you have also people you don't have, you don't think, ah, it's not so, it's not so easy with, to go with him. And on the other side, he's very competent. He's very competent. Those people we envy. In terms of football, I would say in Germany that is um, Bayern München. That's a good club. That's really a really competent club. They win the fourth championship in a row now, last, yesterday. But uh, I don't like them. I really don't like them. They're arrogant. But, but they're really good. They're really good. They're really good. And here, over here, you have people, hmm, they are not so competent. Not so competent, but we love them. We, you know the, such kind of people? They're not really competent, but really we love them and we pity them. In terms of football, I would say that is at the moment, yes, Stuttgart. <laughs> that's really, they're good people. They do their best, but um, yeah, you know, that's... Uh, That's it. And the last category, you know, the last category, there are people we don't like very much and they are really not very competent. Such kind of people, what do we do with such kind of people? We contempt them. Contempt. In terms of football, that is uh, Karlsruhe. You know Karlsruhe? 
the German club. In Switzerland, that's Zurich. It's Zurich. They don't like them. They're not really competent. Forget it all about. But you know, it's not about football. It's not about some uh, relationships only. The really important thing, the really important thing is, hey, what call, um, we should call, recall our attention at the fact that Jesus Christ, he came from, from heaven, from the perfect world. He came with all the warmth, with all the love. From over here, he started. And what, what did he did? He come here, all the way down. All the way down. He came the way down to lift us up, to bring us back here in relationship with our Father in heaven. The Son of Man, he comes on the earth. The foxes, they have their dens and uh, the birds have their nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lie his head. Hey, with other words, Jesus was homeless. He was homeless. And he did it for you and me to lift us up, to bring us back to our Father in heaven. And I want to say something only for these people here in the room who are, call themselves as followers of Christ. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, I want to say something to you. If you are here now as a guest or you are invited, and you would say, no, I don't know if I'm a follower of Christ. I'm looking here around and you are, I don't mean you. You are not the man who I dress now. Sit there, enjoy the rest, drink a coffee later. But the other one who say, I'm a follower of Christ, I want to say something to you. Shane Claiborne, he said that you can't worship a homeless on Sunday and ignore him on Monday. You can't worship a homeless on Sunday and ignore him on Monday. Again, selfish people tend to develop a deformed view of people, which ultimately leads to loneliness. Generous hearts, they are, they, they, they are building bridges to other people. And of course, it takes time. And it, of course, it takes energy. And of course, it takes money. And the last thing, the last thing what Smith describes as a result of a selfish lifestyle. He says, selfish people tend to become more anxious and fearful. They say, the world is evil. Everyone wants more of me, so I better keep everything together. That's the result. The last thing what Smith said, hey, okay, look, that's the result of a selfish lifestyle. Hey, I experienced it, I mentioned it in the beginning, that uh, I'm coming from a, from a home, from parents and my grandparents, and I would say they were, they were not generous. My grandparents survived the World War, and after that they uh, started building a house, a little company and so on. My parents now, they, they later owned their house, through all, my, through all my childhood, I would say generosity, that wasn't a big thing. Keeping all things together, all things together, nothing to give away. Hey, we had bad times, we had bad times after. And now we are, we are looking that everything is here with us. I had to learn to give away. And it took me a long of time. I had to learn to give away and say, hey, I want to saw and I want to see that other people have a benefit of my sawing here. And I have learned something about this lifestyle from my grandparents, from my parents. As long as money or property is the primary source of my personal security, as long will money and poverty be the source of my fears. Sharing 
makes rich. That was the title of the Warp, Forbes magazine. And um, that's true. So let's try it out. I want to encourage you. Make a decision right here in this afternoon. Make a decision and say, I want, I want to sow. I want to give away. I want to see what Christ is doing with the things. I want to see that other people are blessed with my, with my giving. Like the story on the video with the car. I want to see that. And I receive, I, and I receive other things. Please stand up with me here. And uh, I close in prayer. Jesus um, gives us courage, gives us really the courage for giving away things. Give us the courage to bless others. Give us the courage to, um, to soar and see what, what, what you are doing with that. Holy Spirit, I invite you, fill us, fill us with a new um, strength, with a new joy to give, to give things away. In Jesus' name we pray.